I'm Carla Millet. I'm director of the Center for European Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here um, and delighted to introduce uh, our distinguished lecturer on Europe, Jean Boutier. Um, Jean Boutier was a student of uh, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie um, as a young man. Uh, Leroy Ladurie is a very well-known scholar of early modern French history, so he, was, he got off to a very good start. Jean was a research scholar at the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris at, early in his career. There he researched the, um, his masterful volume on maps of Paris, Les Plans de Paris, which appeared in 2002 and in a revised edition in 2007. Um, I've just learned that next week we're going to have, there's going to be a program at the library um, here at the Hatcher Graduate Library Gallery, that one on the third floor, um, on uh, uh, early modern maps of Paris. Jean's going to be giving uh, a presentation on the topic, unfortunately without the Dior gown, which features in this ravishing photograph, but with some equally gorgeous maps. Um, Jean has spent a great deal of time in Italy, knows Italy very well, as a member of the uh, École Française de Rome and as Jean Monnet Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence before he began a position at the École des, Aut uh, des Autres Études en Sciences Sociales in 1993. He served as um, director of the Centre Norbert Elias in Marseille. Now he's on the faculty at the École des Autres Études en Sciences Sociales in Marseille. He is um, Chair of Comparative History of the European Aristocracy from the 16th to 18th century um, at IHES in Paris. And he maintains his scholarly associations with the École Française in Rome. He is, um, this year he's here with us for the semester as a visiting scholar in the History Department at the University of Michigan. Jean has written, co-written, and edited numerous volumes on early modern history in French and in Italian. Um, in recent years, especially, he's been publishing on Italian history and on the lives of in the intellectuals and, and aristocrats who moved between France and Italy, nobles who had so much to do with the origins of a transnational, translingual elite culture in early modern Europe, and um, who, for me, are, as a medievalist, are particularly fascinating because they provide such an interesting link between pre-modern Europe and the early modern period. We're going to hear about some of this research today. Um, the title of Jean's talk is Noble Academies as a European Model of Aristocratic Education. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jean Boutier. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you uh, uh, very much, Carla, for this very kind invitation and this very warm introduction. Um, it's a, an honor and uh, a challenge at the same time to deliver with uh, this uh, annual lecture. To speak of early modern Europe generally leads one to a study of uh, analysis of phenomenon of division, starting from, starting from medieval realities like Christendom of empire, moving on to the emergence of modern states and nations. The understanding of these large processes led, for example, Mark Bloch in the early 1930s to propose one of the first big program of a comparative history of European societies. From this perspective, the early modern period is a decisive phase. It marks the division of Christendom following the Reformation, the confessionalization of societies, the outbreak of the first European conflict with the Thirty Years' War, the building of fortified frontiers, the gigantic growth of professionalized army, and so on. Today, I would like to stress some opposed phenomena that contribute to constructing new shared experiences, which are nevertheless not at all contradictory to the above mentioned processes. I will place myself today within the sphere that the American historian Jonathan Dewalt recently termed aristocratic experience. He locates, this, he locates this not in the field of tradition, but to recall the title of one of his works at the origins of modern culture. After this, these preliminary observations, I propose that we now go forth into one of the central sites of aristocratic Europe, 
at the beginning of the 18th century, the court of Turin. On 24th September 1739, as he had been doing so every week since, the left, the, since he left England and crossed the channel between Dover and Calais in mid-September, Joseph Spence, Regis Professor of Poetry in Oxford since 1728, sat down, sat down to write to his mother. For the third time, he had agreed to accompany a young English aristocrat on a long-term, long long European journey through France and Italy. In September 1730, he had been offered the post of tutor to Charles Sackville, Lord Middlesex, who had just got a Master of Arts from Christ Church Co College, Cambridge, Oxford. This was a two-year-long amazing experience with a long stay in Florence that coincided with the opening of the first Italian Masonic Lodge, attended both by Italian and English. The second tour, in 1737, was short of because his pupil, John Morley, Trevor of Trevelin, had been nominated as a candidate to the House of Commons he had to campaign. Two years later, along with his third pupil, Henry Clinton, This is Joseph Spence, sorry. And this is his student. <laughs> Two years later, along with his third pupil, Henry Clinton, Lord Lincoln, they had rapidly traveled through northern France, Paris, and Lyons, and set themselves up in Turin, the capital of the recent kingdom of Sardinia. This time, Spence, now a very experienced tutor, proposed a quite different program. Instead of a perpetual motion, as he said, through France, then Italy during two or three years, Spence planned to begin the tour with a long stay in the Academy of Turin, a very aristocratic institution for young nobles, next to the court of Charles Emmanuel II of Savoy. His letters, in his letters, Spence gives a kind of thick description of this new academic life. I quote, we live here in the academy where my lord learned to ride, fence, and dance. It is to be quite a college life. For we are very regular in our hour of dining and supping, eat at a table with the governors and the principal scholars, who are a Sardinian marquis, a Polish earl, a young nobleman from Switzerland, an Irish gentleman, and ourselves from England. So that, you see, we are made up of all nations and like old Noah in this ark, ark, can show a specimen of almost every beast. I say that only in jest, for they are a very agreeable and very polite set of people. A Noah's ark. The biblical image used by Spence is developed in another letter two months later. This good company is an exceptional collection of beasts of all quarters of the world. In other words, a fine selection of the rural European aristocracy. Even in the, if the image seems excessive and impresses, it shows the distance, for example, from the narrow British Oxford College at this time. Spence gives a lively and witty portrait of each young aristocrat. Next to the wild Irish is a young, plump, rosy-cheeked marquis, whose title is Marquis of Legon, Probably not a Tuscan, but a Piemontese noble from the Simian family from French origin, in other words, a local, attended by a sensible looking, well behaved Roman abbe. If Spence doesn't give precision about the other Italian young noble presented as a thin jawed black marquis from Sardinia, he's more explicit about the gentleman from Poland, a certain Langskorowski, accompanied by a Prussian uh, governor whose family lives in the farthest border, I quote, of that country within a dozen mile of the Turks in the province of Podolia. A very devout Catholic and, I quote, a great dealer of reliques. With two other nobles from Savoy, a doctor from the university and a young girl, and a young Earl, not girl in this place, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> another young Swiss gentleman of about 17 called Louis Auguste Erlach who does his exercises, 
Spence sa uh, says, as well as anybody in the academy. In fact, he's at this time a captain in the King of Sardinia's service and will move some years later to the Swiss Guard of the King of France in Paris. Finally, a perfect German Earl is accompanied by an old-fashioned governor from Bohemia, wearing, I quote, a green coat as old as himself. In all, it's a quite small company. Even if we don't have precise figure, clearly the number varied from 20, 20, uh, 15 to 20 each year see, in the 1730s. Their profile remained the same, very open, internationally attractive, but at the same time very selective and quite intimate. The court was thus a place of encounters between Western and Eastern Europe, beyond religious differences and without any linguistic difficulties, if we correctly interpret this, the absence of remarks on this matter by in Spence letters. Beyond this pleasant description, which insists both on personal features and national elements, the daily coexistence of this agreeable and polite society highlights a certain numbers of shared values and so social behaviors, which are at the basis of teaching in this academy and more generally in all similar educational institutions all over Europe. The young Lord Lincoln evokes this common program in a letter to, the, to his uncle. All the masters are, are extremely good and take a great deal of pains. We begin riding at 8 o'clock in the morning, dance at 10, fence at 11, all dine together at half uh, an hour after 12. The governor and sub-governors with us were both men of quality and have, particularly oblige, and have been particularly obliging to me. The teaching is prolonged in the afternoon by a master of Italian language and evenings are devoted to social life and court activities. The academy in this way looks like a finishing school, evoked very precisely 10 years later by Lord Chesterfield, a famous English writer, in one of his famous letters sent to his son during his five-year-long grand tour and which became in the 1770s one of the more Im most important book of etiquette for English society and English nobility. I quote this long letter which gives you an, another idea of this Turin Academy. I will now tell you what I expect and insist upon from you at Turin. First, that you pursue your classical and other studies every morning. Program a little difference, you see. Secondly, that you learn uninterruptedly your exercises of riding, dancing, and fencing. Here we are. Thirdly, that you make yourself master of the Italian language. And lastly, that you pass every evening in the best company. I also require a strict conformity to the hours and rules of the academy. If you will finish your year in this manner in Turin, I have nothing further to, ask, further to ask of you, and I will give you everything that you can ask of me. You shall, after that, be entirely your own master. Lord Chesterfield could conclude, go through it well, and you will be all accomplished. Spence's letter gives more details about this daily academic life and its subtle articulation between learning, training, and social life in Turin. Immediately after his arrival, the young lord has been welcomed by Arthur Villettes from a French Huguenot family, who was at the same time the secretary of the British ambassador before becoming ambassador himself in Turin and then in Switzerland. Villette was, a very well was very well acquainted with the Duke of Newcastle, the then Secretary of State for 30 years, and the British Secretary of State for Foreign Policy for 30 years, and future, future Prime Minister during the uh, 1750s, and Lord Lincoln's uncle. Villette introduced Lord Lincoln to all the assemblies which have here every night and all the best company in Turin. The academy was very close to the court, considered at this time as one of the finest in Europe and had strong links with court life. Lincoln had frequent discussion with the prime minister to whom he, had, he has been recommended by his, his uncle and with many other ministers. In Turin, it was even quite easy for a young aristocrat like Lord Lincoln to be presented to the king himself. 
The King Charles Emmanuel III, in particular, he write, he, uh, Link, Lord Lincoln wrote to his uncle, the Duke of Newcastle, the king in particular has been extremely civil to me. Le uh, I had the honor last week of dining and hunting with the, his majesty. We had a chase of five hours and a half, and I gained much honor in stopping the hounds as they were running the wrong deer. Lincoln left Terry in September 1740 after 11 months spent in the academy. In 1739, the Terry Academy was not a very old institution. It had been created 60 years earlier, in January 1678, by Maria Giovanna Battista of Savoy, widow of the Duke Charles Emmanuel II, to teach young noblemen from all over Europe, to, to, to teach them in French, because the dépliant was in French, tout ce qui est capable de former l'esprit et le corps d'un gentilhomme. All that is necessary to form the spirit and the body of a gentleman. It was conceived at, as a small boarding school where young gentlemen were taught, fed, and lodged together with their tutors, gouverneur, or Hofmeister, according to the country where they come from. It was planned as an important tool to enlarge the influence of the Duke of Savoy, a prince who was at this time trying to obtain a royal title. But at the same time, it was based on an educational model which emerged during the first decade of the 16th century in Italy and then rapidly reached most of the European countries. It started with a complex transformation of what a noble ought to be, not only to display his military skills, but also to grow into an active and experienced courtier and a competent servant of the developing monarchic monarchical states. Although it may seem quite unrealistic, but dated Utopia 17th March, it claims to belong to a, kind, a new kind of political fiction an early manifestation of such new cultural claim is given by the famous later saint by the giant Gargantua to his young son Pantagruel, living as in studying in Paris. The letter was inserted by Rabelais in his novel Pantagruel, published in 1532. Rabelais exposed a kind of impossible encyclopedic program of education, corresponding to all the requirements and extension of humanist knowledge. The prince has to master all that Renaissance humanism had made available and to, access and to excel in each subject. Ancient languages, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, but also Arabic, history, cosmography, liberal arts, astronomy, astrology, law, philosophy, natural sciences, and medicine from the mastery of the holy scriptures to the new discovery of the human body thanks to the recent use of dissection. In fact, Rabelais is presenting the ideal education of a perfect prince, not a simple noble. But the discussions about the ideal prince had a strong influence on the nobility's attitudes towards education. A decisive change analyzed by John Exter for England, France, and Netherlands in a seminal paper published more than half a century ago which led to the invention of a new kind of educational institution and new educational patterns for the whole nobility. If we would like to trace the formation and diffusion of the new social pattern, we could start with the publication in Venice in 1528 of a very sophisticated dialogue between some noblemen and noble women situated at the small court of Urbino in central Italy. The author is Baldassar Castiglione. Born in an ancient noble family from Lombardy, through his mother, he was related to the Gonzaga family and was very active at their court. Till 1504, when he asked the Duke Francesco Gonzaga to the permission to take up residence in the court of Urbino, near Guidobaldo da Montefeltro and his wife, sister of Francesco, the Duchess Elisabetta Gonzaga. Albino was 
a little like Turin in the 18th century, one of the most refined and prestigious Italian court of the time. The book stages an informal and lively conversation which takes place for over a span of four days in 1507. It presents a discussion about the ideal gentleman between several famous courtiers, both men and women, in presence of Elizabeth Gonzaga herself. Drawing Avile from two famous treatises of Cicero, the offices or the duties of gentlemen, and the oratore or the ideal orator citizen, it presents the aim of a perfect gentleman as an active life of public service. If the perfect gentleman must be a man of arms, skilled in horsemanship, he must more generally excel in all he does, fighting, poetry, music, drawing or dancing, without apparent effort and make everything look easy and natural. If one of the participants insists that the art of being a perfect courtier is something that cannot be taught, all eventually agree upon the fact that the courtly perfection must be acquired through practice and imitation. If the dia dialogue touches, touches on a variety of other questions, the discussion of a new cultural model which proposed a subtle, a subtle combined apprenticeship of arms and letters is a touchstone to identify some of the new characteristics of the early modern European nobilities. First published in Venice, in Italian, the book was rapidly translated in the main European languages, in Spanish in 1534, in French in, uh, with two translations in Paris and in Lens, in Latin in Wittenberg, in Germany, in English by a very famous uh, courtier of Elizabeth I, Thomas Hobby, in uh, German, and later at the end of the 17th century in Dutch. Its large number of reprints, as you can see on the, on the, gra on the graph, uh, is that its large number of reprints is an obvious sign of, the wi of its wide success, which played an effective role in modifying attitudes of the nobility towards education. It's important to highlight the fact, the fact that the main period of diffusion of Castilian courtier, the years 15th, uh, 1530s, 1620s, corresponded more or less to the period both of invention and early diffusion of academies for novels and of opening of a large debate about the necessary education for the nobility. We still know very little about the first academies of, for the education of the nobility. What is certain is the fact that they were organized in some important cities of northern Italy around the middle of the 16th century as a private and not an official initiative of the city or the state. Nonetheless, they were a collective attempt to answer to the challenge of the new cultural models of nobility. I was very lucky some years ago to discover in the public archives of Vicenza, one of the seven noble cities of the Italian, of the Venetian state, a copy, uh, this was, oh sorry, a quotation, about the importance of Castigliano from Torquato Tasso, and uh, here we are with the Venetian state, a copy of a contract signed on 20th January 1563 by a dozen gentlemen who had gathered in the family palace of Nicola Tiene, a member of a very ancient family of knights. These gentlemen had recently created an academy for riding and fencing. The contract is in Latin. Academia Equitatus et Armorum, which they wanted to register and officialize by a notary act. This company of gentlemen, as they called themselves, was a private institution, totally financed by its members, whose purposes and expectations were very clearly exposed at the beginning of the contract. As these above mentioned gentlemen are well aware how useful Convenient and honorable it is for a gentleman to know how to ride well and to use weapons, since the exercise of horsemanship occupies the first place among all others, and a gentleman in time of war as well as peace is used to ride and hold a sword on his side, etc. The first step in the decision is a clear identification of what constitute both 
a daily tool and the status symbol of a nobleman, mainly a horse and a sword. At first glance, nothing very new. But in fact, this assertion reflected an important shift which occurred during the 16th century, a kind of aestheticization of the violence of the warrior from riding to equestrian arts, from swordsmanship to fencing. Such an aestheticization was materialized by the first publication in the 1550s of a new kind of treatises on horsemanship, arts of riding, arte del cavalcare, and fencing. <coughs> The second element is more clearly a really new statement. Nobles are not naturally, by birth, by birth, good riders and warriors. I quote, in no profession of art was one ever born a master, as it is commonly stated, but everything has to be learned but by exercising with persons who know how to teach and exercise. Their conclusion is logical. They have to hire and pay a master of equestrian arts and a master of fencing. They f then follow 11 articles which constitute the official rules of the company of gentlemen established for three years and directed by a prince, prince an elected prince with two councillors, elected every four months. This quite exceptional document is perhaps one of the first pieces of evidence at the European level of the creation of an Academy of Education for Nobles. At first glance, the institution appears somewhat simple, created for a limited period. It's subsidized by its founders and not by any public institution, as such as cities, regions, estates, princes, or states. But two elements are central and set it apart. Two disciplines, two arts are essential to make nobles, the equestrian art and the art of fencing. The total mastery of this art does not come naturally, but must be acquired and then mastered through learning. This is, I think, a significant turning point in the social history of the Italian nobilities and even more of European nobilities. The constitution of an academy, this is the word used in the Notary Act, could be analyzed as a micro event in a limited local context. It implies a small group of people living in the city. It doesn't require inter intervention from outside. All the pa families participating in this creation were well-known families belonging to an ancient aristocracy, often with feudal roots. Many of their ancestors were soldiers involved in the Italian wars, and all had been active since decades, since decades in the government of the city. The birth of this new educational institution could thus be analyzed as the means of keeping local power by maintaining a traditional culture based on aristocratic honor and values. These ancient families could thus have tried to oppose the rising power of new families using the juridical professionals as a path of affirming their more effective skills and capacities in holding political positions in the city government. I will today choose to give the agreement a larger dimension, cultural, political, and social at the same time, considering it as the sign of a major turning point in the history of European aristocracies. A turning point that may, appears, that may appear, in a certain way, paradoxical if we consider the, mi the, the middle of the 16th century as a key period of the military revolution, which transformed the manner of waging war all over Europe. During the 16th century, the ancient medieval knights were completely replaced by the infantry, and firearms of all kinds kinds transform blade weapons into obsolete military tools. For this point of view, these academies for nobles were not a kind of professional school, but a part of a process whereby of more or less institutionalized education began to erode the traditional right to command based on birth and an informal familiarity with horse and sword. Which happened in Vicenza was not in fact a single uh, isolated event. In Italy, several associations or, acad or academies during the 1550s, 1580s were open to propose training and lectures to provide an adequate education to young men. I've put on the map uh, in a kind of red rectangle the cities which organized, the academies organized, the name of the cities where academies were organized during the, the, the last decade of the uh, 16th century. 
and so um, and I'm certain that uh, further research in local archives would broaden uh, broaden uh, the 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 cases and enrich this picture with more details on the effective reality of these academies. This phenomenon is a, speci is a specific aspect of a larger phenomenon, which is the development since the 1520s, 1530s, of a more institutionalized secondary education with the creation in many cities, in France, in Italy, in Germany, of colleges urban institutions at the beginning, they were rapidly taken over by new religious orders, which considered education a powerful means to keep control of social elites in a critical period of religious crisis. These early initiatives were probably planned as a local response to the colleges established by the religious order of the Catholic reform, such as the Jesuits who opened their first college in Italy in Messina in 1547. The first creations were rapidly followed by establishment of colleges in the main Italian cities like Padua, Venice, Naples, Bologna, Milan, etc. You would find more or less the same uh, cities uh, for the, as uh, for the academies. The creation of academies pushed the Jesuit to modify their initial proposal and to create specific sections or institutions specialized in education for nobles called Seminaria Nobilium seminaries for nobles. The first one was opened in Milan in 1574, and rapidly a very dense network was built in northern and central Italy, about 15 colleges between uh, 1570 and 1620, which may uh, be uh, eventually limited the impact of the academies for nobles. Furthermore, this preoccupation was not strictly limited to Italy, but, and this is a second important element, was more widely taken into account by other European nobilities. The 1570s and 1580s is a period of large discussion about the new issue of education for transforming nobility. In England, around 1570, just to give an example, with the support of William Cecil, Lord Burley, one of the main secretaries of Elizabeth I, uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who had been governor of Ulster and had, been, and had been recently elected member of the parliament, presented a project for, I quote the title, the erection of an academy in London for the education of Her Majesty's wards and others, the youth of nobility and gentlemen. The project was a little similar to a rebellious one, very ambitious and combining the main humanist discipline with, as in the Italian academies, riding, fencing, dancing, and playing musical instrument. The school had to be called Queen Elizabeth, possessive case, Academy. In France, some, year later, some years later, at the end of the uh, 1570s, a series of books, mainly by Protestant authors, promoted the importance of a specific education for gentlemen based on moral philosophy and history with a strong insistence on physical activities. One of the most detailed projects was presented by a Protestant noble, François de Lannoux, whose family was, had military traditions going back to the 12th century, and who was one of the most loyal members of the Calvinist armies during the French Civil Wars. He wrote his Discours Politique and, and Militaire, Political and Military Discourses, during his confinement in the early 1580s in Germany. His main concern was the education of young, of young noble d'épée, for whom he proposed the creation of four academies that could be opened in some cities in France. This is a, a map of these. You know, there are different projects, and you can see, you know, some important cities. So uh, uh, these academies would have been uh, established in the main French cities, which are Paris, Lyon, and Bordeaux and uh, other places which were regular residences of the, of the, of the king. Uh, in the Loire, Loire Valley, for example, Angers, Tours, Plessis des Tours, Fontainebleau. So you see the mix of the, for the cities and for the court. Uh, the book itself had uh, the, uh, these uh, uh, political and military discourses. Uh, uh, the book itself had a strong impact, not only in France, but also in Germany, where German translation 
published in Frankfurt in uh, 1592, only five years later after the French edition, was widely read and influenced several projects at the beginning of the 17th century. In France, as well as, uh, as, well as in Italy, uh, but also in Germany, active academies were open in a limited number of places. So it's not necessary to give uh, a precise uh, list of these academies. Most of them were in the main cities. Some were financed by what we uh, call in France regional estates, which were uh, regional assemblies, which financed them with the fiscal revenues. Some were uh, uh, backed by uh, uh, city uh, councils, but very often they were private, private initiative, uh, and uh, they asked for uh, what is a, a real privilege. That means, you know, more a protection, a symbolic protection, than a, a real uh, financial uh, support. And this uh, network was admired by the Venetian ambassador in France which on his return uh, in Italy expanded in uh, the Venetian area, the, the Italian uh, network. In, in Germany, the, the first creations are more or less contemporary. Uh, and uh, the, more, uh, the most important one, I will give you some more details, was uh, established as uh, the Collegium Illustre, the, the famous college, uh, open in Tübingen by the, the Duke uh, in, of uh, Westphalia uh, in 1594. And it was an outright success with several stu uh, hundreds of students in the following years. If the uh, uh, material, uh, uh, the archival material is quite rare for France and Italy, it is more abundant for Germany. Uh, some literary and pictorial description give us a precise idea of what was the daily organization of these academies. The uh, Swiss traveler, Thomas Platter, wrote on his uh, return a long and detailed account of his travels through France during the years 1595-1599. Uh, In Brouage, Brouage is a small uh, no, huh? Uh, okay, I think this, yes, Bois in in this in this area on the coast on the coastal side, <coughs> and, uh, on the Atlantic uh, uh, Ocean. I quote and uh, give you a description. Uh, you you will find something very similar to the uh, Terran Academy uh, one year one uh, century and a half later. In Bois, there is a special academy according to the term used by the French. Here, training and teaching is provided to young noblemen and other well-born lords in all kinds of exercises and equestrian games. They are taught horse riding, vaulting, dance, fencing, playing the lute, and similar activities. The students are accompanied by a rector, paid by the French king in this case, as well by, as by the students. For these equestrian exercises, the rector maintained the best riding masters, fencing and dance masters, Splendid indeed in his stable in which is his stable in which the houses some dozens of horses, each more magnificent than the other. In parallel, the students learn to straddle their mounts, run at the ring, etc. Then they follow the fencing class, next come vaulting, and so on and so on. Two years in general is generally the period of education in these academies, sometimes more, sometimes less. The students are mostly between 14, 20 years. It is rare that they are younger or older. The young noble no longer need go to Italy to train himself, he enters the army to engage in war, or enters the service of a great lord. For a gentleman, <coughs> it is considered worthless and useless if he has not been trained in all the discipline I've just indicated. Some is Later, a small booklet from the beginning of the 17th century give a true ima a true, an image and illustrates through a series of engravings the activities followed by the young nobles in the Collegium Illustre created by uh, uh, the Duke of Wittenberg at Tübingen, capital of his duchy. The, this is... Sorry. I'm not... 
This is uh, uh, okay. this is the city of Tübingen uh, uh, before uh, the siege uh, of uh, 1630. Uh, so it's a, 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 a medium-sized city on the Neckar, which is the, the river. And uh, on top, you can see the castle of the Duke of, of uh, Württemberg. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see two things. It's not very clear on the image, but the, the letter C, which is there, is the main building of the, of the university. And the letter D, which is a more, more imposing uh, building, is the central uh, building of the Nobel Academy, the Collegium Illustre. So you see they are not far from one to the other, and they are just dominated by the uh, ducal power uh, embodied or uh, symbolized by the uh, large castle on top of the hill. This is a, a more uh, precise uh, uh, view of the, of the academy with the castle behind, with a legend in Latin or in German. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a kind of publicity for nobilities coming from all over Europe and not only Protestant. Uh, uh, Tübingen is a Lutheran city. Uh, uh, and you see on, on this series of images, first, the uh, combination of university courses and academic activities. So this is a lecture uh, in uh, a uh, uh, main classroom of the academy, nothing special for you. Uh, this is the library, maybe a little different for uh, our own library, library now. Uh, and Tübingen is a large, uh, was famous for its large uh, library at the time. Uh, and then from the university to the academy, and you can see the different exercises for the young uh, noble who are trained uh, there. So uh, exercises of uh, different kind of fencing, you know, it, uh, the, uh, the poem, which is kind of a uh, game of tennis in, in a, a closed room. And, and this is, oh, and there is normally another image, but I don't put the image, which is a, a bowl at night uh, in, the, uh, in the, the main room of the, of the academy. So maybe uh, this kind of image uh, may, uh, is useful for you to uh, have a more precise idea of what, are, uh, what is the organization and what is the material uh, dimension of uh, this institution, and you can see that there is not so much difference between the beginning of the 16th, 17th century and the first decade of the uh, 18th century, as described as uh, by uh, Spence uh, in uh, its uh, uh, letter. I would have liked, but uh, I don't want to be too long, uh, uh, give you a very uh, paradoxical, paradoxical uh, um, image of what happened during the first half of the 17th century. On one side, a sudden success of some uh, of these uh, academic institutions, mainly in Germany, and uh, in some Italian cities and in Paris, the success is more irregular in the other, for example, provincial French cities. And at the same time, the, uh, uh, the, the I would say, the, the interest by the states uh, for this kind of institution to form the uh, nobles, they need not only at the army, but in the new uh, uh, bureaucratic and, and uh, administrative apparatus. And uh, th there is a very interesting case, is, uh, which is the fact that in the two main and more powerful European monarchies, which are at this time Spain and France, more or less at the same moment, uh, the 1620s and the 1630s, we have a series of projects very similar 
which try to establish academies in the capitals and all over the, king the kingdom to uh, train a large group of nobles to become servant of the states. And their authors are the main uh, ministers in Spain, Olivares, and in France, first Richelieu, and then a little later, Mazarin. And what is interesting is the fact that all these projects failed. And of maybe for different reasons, financial. In France, Richelieu uh, tried to materialize his project in the second half of the 1630s. It's the moment when the kingdom entered the 30 years uh, war. And so I would say that uh, most of the financial resources of, this, of the monarchy uh, went to the war. And so, uh, and, but at the same time, there is not a very strong interest manifested in these state institutions by the nobility. So there is some you know, distance from you know, most of the nobles uh, who maybe don't or didn't want at this time to be too much involved in the process of the new, uh, or the new process of state building, which happened and which, uh, which uh, accelerated with the wars at this time. So uh, uh, I would say there are some very paradoxical uh, developments of this institution, which uh, after these two failures in Spain in, and in France as central state institution, followed two uh, different lines. The first one, many academies became more and more focused on equestrian arts and fencing offering their students the possibility of learning other subjects with external teachers. For example, it's the case of Paris with eight academies at the midst of the uh, 17th century. Paris became one of the centers of what was called the noble exercises uh, for, for uh, the European nobility. But uh, this these, uh, 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 situation uh, uh, encountered very uh, strong difficulties during the 18th century. I'll explain it in conclusion. On the contrary, some academies of uh, transformed themselves into true colleges for nobles, proposing teachings covering a broad range of subjects in different disciplines. I don't want to, <coughs> it's not necessary I think, to detail them, but from liberal arts to all the uh, uh, um, physical exercises we have seen uh, in the uh, previous developments. Uh, at the beginning uh, of the 18th century, some of them even introduced lectures in natural philosophy, that means physics or chemistry, and some more technical disciplines, thus combining a sense of traditional noble culture with a continuous opening to the contemporary world. This was mainly the case with new academies founded from 1650s onwards in the capitals of small states which affirmed themselves as major references for aristocratic Europe. Brussels, 1671, Turin, 1678-79, Wolfenbüttel in Germany, 1687, Florence, Florence sorry, uh, 1689, Nancy in Lorraine, 1699, rapidly became points of convergence where young aristocrats from all over Europe could receive the indispensable teaching and initiate themselves at the same time in courtly etiquette and behavior by attending the court of the prince who had founded the academy. Despite opening up their portals to a wide range of discipline, academy kept their specific model, socially and culturally defined, which strongly differed from the colleges of uh, Catholic Europe or from universities of German world. The institutional model they proposed beyond this diversity I have shown presents some important features. First, firstly, at the academy, the, uh, the heart of the teaching, and I don't want to repeat what I have said, remained till the, the end of the 18th century, equestrian arts uh, and military discipline. These two matters or these two disciplines were not approached simply according to their technical dimension, but as a discipline of the noble body which lead to self-discipline on one side 
and to the capacity of leading people at the army as well as in the political world on the other side. In this sense, dancing and playing music were directly linked to them, discipline and everyday control of individuals, spaces and time was strictly organized and imposed as revealed by the set of rules and regulations, like this one, this is the rules of the Academy of Nancy, which each academy printed and circulated all over Europe. They clearly list the do's and don'ts, including timing to be respected by the nobles, norms of behavior, prohibition of playing cards, and the constant surveillance by the pupil's tutor. Secondly, its organization was not accompanied by a strictly a strict scholarly program such as that initiated by the Jesuit Russia Studio Room. The academy never s adopted a system of classes invented by the Jesuits. On the contrary, it was a place where each student had the liberty to choose the kind of courses he wished to follow. The noble could enter the academy when he liked and leave when it wished. In the 17th century, the principal academies became a central place of accommodation and training for the young nobles engaged on their grand tour. The rest archives that enable us to evaluate the time spent in the academy show the, the very contrasting period spent there from a few weeks to a maximum long term of two, three years. Lastly, the principal academies were not institutions that limited themselves to recruiting locally in the city of or its surroundings region. The number of foreigners, though very variable, depending on the places or the monuments, time of peace being naturally more favorable than times of war, was always quite significant. The Academy of Angers, for example, during the years uh, beginning of the 17th century, welcomed more than six, for, uh, welcomed about 650 foreigners, principally from, from Northern Europe, the German world, Poland, Netherlands, and the Spanish Low Countries. They were not limited to the core of Western Europe, but included also young men from England and Scotland, but also the Scandinavian world, Sweden and Denmark, and some rural nobles from Central Europe. The main Italian seminarian nobilium presented the same profile. For example, in the College of Parma, near Milan uh, during the 17th century, only 12% of the students came from the city and the duchy, and most of them came from Italy and from Central Europe, from the imperial area of uh, uh, Europe. In fact, this multidimensional dimension was particularly strong in Western Europe, in cities that were stopping points in the Grand Tour, more particularly in France and in Italy. If we look at the new uh, uh, noble academies which were established in uh, Central or Eastern Europe, they were, uh, they, uh, they were, uh, uh, the, the students were more uh, of local origin than in uh, France or in Italy. Academies continued to function as a dynamic institution in the 18th century. New academies continued to emerge in Western Europe, in France, five or six new academies in the 18th century, as well as in Eastern Europe. Uh, this, is, this was the, no, the, the, I spoke about Parma, and every year there was a list of the uh, Nobel students called Signori Convittori, because it's boarding school, so they live in the uh, inside, they live in the academy, and this is, you know, the printed list of the students of the year, and if we, if you look at this, there is always the origin of the students, so it could be easy, and it has been done anyway by an Italian uh, colleague. It is easy to uh, trace, you know, the origin, the geographical and political origins of the students during the year. Um, but also in, uh, so there are new academies uh, open in Western Europe, but also in Central Europe. Uh, uh, and in Western Europe, this is the uh, academy in uh, Lignitz, which is actually in Poland. The academic model of education was still being proposed, even by the most enlightened men of the town. The philosopher Leibniz, for example, who had just been given the responsibility of creating, creating the Academy of Science, another uh, reality of science and letters of Berlin, by the Prince Elector Frederick I of Brandenburg, advised the Prime Minister of the Duke of Brunswick, who had become King of England, to establish an academy for nobles 
in another in 1715. According to Leibniz, this could, uh, this could serve the Duke subject as well as the first station of the English who wished to prepare themselves to see the world, beginning of the Grand Tour. That is to say, young Englishmen embarking on their tour on the continent. Such a dynamism was reflected in the construction of new building for academies, as for example, this spectacular baroque architecture of the Ritter Academy of Lignitz in Silesia, built in the year 1726-38, designed by a famous Austrian architect, Josef Emanuel Fischer von Erlach, the chief court architect of the emperor. However, the noble academies entered into competition with a new kind of school for nobles, the professional school destined to the training of the military officers, the engineers, and even the diplomats with the political academies, for example, of, in Paris or Strasbourg. The French one are very well known. They were also very numerous and active in other countries. For example, when the new Bourbon king, Philip V, reopened, the Real Seminario de Nobles in Madrid and opened a, a lot of specialized school for nobles all over Spain. This model was quite different from the academic one. The new schools only accepted a limited number of students, between, between 20 and 50 every year in the Royal School of Military Engineers in Mezières in France, set up in 1748. A student had to spend a fixed time at school, two years in Mezier, for a specific program and pass final exams, and has to pass an exam to be admitted to. Above all, these processes of specialization and professionalization were now conducted at a national scale. The students were recruited to serve their own sovereign and state. In the so-called cosmopolitan enlightenment, the internationally open dimension of the academies was disappearing. For many other reasons also, many academies entered in a difficult period and had to diminish their activities. Not mainly and not necessarily the smaller ones had to close for lack of students. The Grand Duke Peter Leopold of Tuscany decided to close its academy in Florence in 1774. In Vienna, the reformist writer Josef von Sonnenfels criticized academies for nobles and invited Emperor Joseph II, the elder brother of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, to merge the two Viennese Ritter Academy in a single one in 1778, and then ultimately to close it five years later. Between the 16th and the 18th centuries, the conception of society had changed considerably. This is very a very <laughs> obvious uh, statement. At the time of the Renaissance, the treatises of the courtier and the nobility sought to clearly distinguish the gentilhomme from the rest of society. At the end of the 18th century, a more individualized conception of an organic society had emerged, where common interest depended less on the quality of the nobility as a group than on the talents of individuals of all kinds which composed society in all its diversity. It is quite in the development of this second conception that the model of the noble academies ended by becoming quite out fashioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we can open the floor to questions. Would you like to questions? Yes, of course. <laughs> I thank you so much uh, for a really rich, uh, enlightening uh, talk. Absolutely not academic. <laughs> uh, I have a question. It actually comes from a conversation I've had with you, which is, does this growth <coughs> of academies, of the, the growth of the number of academies across Europe, and the need for the academies that have, you know, printed statutes and so on, does that not relate to the growth of the aristocracy to include people who, in an earlier time, would not have been considered aristocracy as aristocratic titles 
and more and more there are more and more people with aristocratic titles who may not have been brought up as well as uh, had been people in an earlier generation. No? Isn't there something going on here? But. Uh, uh First of all, as everyone who has a certain familiarity with the early modern period, we, there is what, Lore, what uh, Lawrence Stone called the inflation, inflation, inflation of titles. That means the, the growing of aristocracies, which is a very general European, European uh, reality. But even in the 18th century, there are very different, you know, uh, nobilities. That means. In some countries, a very small group, restricted group, for example, from the English one, uh, less than one person of the nobility of the no, of the population, and other one, like uh, Eastern Europe, the Russian nobility or the Polish nobility, which is a very large, uh, ten percent of the population was considered as noble at this time. So, there are big differences. Uh, I, I don't think it's linked to um, this kind of social change, because. Um, uh, it's it's more linked that there is a, a, a new international of the aristocracy of the nobility which developed in the from the 16th century onwards for different reasons, and uh, uh, there is a, also a competition between courts, not big between big courts but small courts. The 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 règlement, the rules I sh I've shown you, which uh, are the rules of the Academy of Nancy, which has been created by the Duke of Na of Lorraine. I don't know what you say in English, Lorraine, it's okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, in, at the end of the 17th century, uh, immediately he printed, as well as the Duchess of Savoy, she did exactly the same thing, we have exactly the same manifesto, the same poster. So they printed a, a certain number, I don't know the number, I, I think several uh, thousand of, of, of copies of these prints, which were sent to the, all the European courts to invite people to come and uh, attend the academy for uh, as many times as uh, uh, as, as many weeks as uh, uh, as they want. So I, I think it's this kind of competition between courts, you know, the power of these new princes uh, who are not sovereign people. They, are, they don't have the title of king, you know, the Duke of Lorraine, the Duke of Savoy. The Duke of Savoy is more lucky because he became uh, king at the beginning of the 18th century. But they, there is this kind of competition. The Grand Duke of Tuscany, the same, he wanted to be the first, the first duke in, in Italy, and then even more. So uh, I think there is this kind of competition between these new academies, which were created in the second half of the 17th century, more than the, uh, more than the the, the 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 growth of the nobility. Because if we look at those who really attended these academies, it's, small, it's a small group among the, the huge and large group of uh, European nobilities. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, two questions. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. One of them uh, is, uh, what's happening to noble women at this time? Are <laughs> <laughs> about the military and, you know, swordsmanship and dance and everything, those are not very contentious topics. And then they go to the court, that is also not contentious. But what about religious practice? I mean, because seven days a week, you know, you can do this five days, but what do you do the other two? <laughs> so thank you for your questions. Uh, first, f to trying to, to answer your first question, this is why I tried to find a, you know, a woman that put the image of, of the Duchess of Savoy because she was <laughs> the only woman in my, in my talk. Uh, no, there were absolutely no women in this kind of academies, first point. Uh, because I think there is a difference of age at, 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 uh, at the marriage. So uh, girls were married earlier than boys. And so I think that the, the period of the fi finishing school correspond to the uh, years between the marriage of the, of the girls and the marriage of the boys. So first, very simple uh, answer. Second, they, there, is, there are some specific 
uh, institutions which were uh, created during the seven, second half of uh, the 17th uh, century to give a very aristocratic education to uh, girls from family of the high aristocracy. Uh, it's called the Demoiselle de saint cyr in France, for example. It's a very famous institution. And I know uh, I, I attended a um, um, conference in, in Moscow in September about education of the nobility. And there are similar things uh, in, in Russia in, in, in during the, 17th, uh, the 18th century. So there are specific institutions, but which are very different because they are more religious. They are more like convents and not like this kind of open liberal. What, what, uh, what uh, always surprised me when, when I began uh, uh, studying this institution is the incredible liberal free, uh, 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 idea of freedom. Someone can arrive whenever he likes during the year, uh, leave whenever he, he, he wants. The only responsible of the boy is his tutor, who is in, in charge of decision. Yeah, because he's, he's in, in straight correspondence with the family, with the father in general, or the mother if, if she's a widower. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a, a chapter of the history of masculinity, this kind of institution. And then religion. Ah, religion, sorry. Uh, from this uh, aspect, it's very interesting because uh, there is no religious requirement in this institution during the 17th century. And the, I think this is why there is a strong competition between Jesuit colleges and this kind of academies. And so and you can see the dialectics between the both institutions. Obviously, uh, there are more students in the Jesuit colleges because they are more socially open. Uh, but I think that the creation of these academies, it is one of my hypotheses, but for the moment I have no precise evidence, is a reaction to the creation of the first Jesuit colleges. So the idea that you have to follow very religious uh, behavior, you have to follow religious rules. Uh, so th this is why I, I, have, I have, you know, uh, um, given some very precise uh, um, features of the, this small society in Turin, because there is the Swiss is 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 a Calvinist, the German is Lutheran, the the Pope is devout Catholic, the, uh, the uh, Irish is Catholic, and Lord Lincoln is, is an Anglican. So, and there is, no, it, there is no problem. And Spence writes every week in a very precise way and gives a very precise account of the daily life. And Lord Lincoln himself writes to his uncle. So we have a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, precision. Maybe as in, in, in every kind of testimony, there are silence, as you know. but. Uh, I don't have the impression because we can use them judici judicial resources to f to see their fights or you know some violence or physical violence which were uh, sued uh, and 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 at the judicial con consequences. But um, for the moment, for the moment, <laughs> uh, stories with girls or with ladies at court, of course, but uh, no religious problem. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, given that the institutions were open to the nobles at any time, they could come when they want, go when they want, how financially sound were they? they I assume that you paid tuition, and you paid for your room and board and lodging, but if the, if the attendance was so irregular, it must have relied entirely on the largesse of the duke or the, or the founding patron mm. to maintain a curriculum and staff and... It was, yes, um, it was, first of all, quite expensive. Mm. First point, uh, the student, let's say, the student, the academist in French and in Italian, it's the same word, uh, uh, had to pay per month, not per day, per month, and uh, and uh, following the, st the 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 statutes I've found I've I've uh, shown, there is in general uh, another sheet printed sheet with the uh, tariff tariff you know what, what they have to pay and it's very detailed one because you have to pay for the room you have to pay for uh, the food we have to pay each masters so you pay directly the masters uh, you have to pay if you uh, for the horse riding you have to pay 
for you know the the specific person who are in charge of specific tools for specific exercise. So every time you use this kind of tool, you have to pay a certain amount. So there is a very detailed tariff of all you have to pay. So this is why you can, you can understand you can leave whenever you 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 want. Because you pay as you go. Yes, that's right. That's right. So this is the, this is the financial aspect. Yes. Um, as you know, there are, there were many many uh, choices, educational choices. That that's right. Families of nobles in the 17th and 18th century, um, uh, college, private tutoring, uh, école de page, uh, eventually the state state run schools like the école militaire. Uh, and, and that's yeah, that's why the. Yeah. <laughs> um, and do you have a sense of? What kinds of people chose the academies and why, as opposed to some of the other possibilities they had? Uh, I think um, there is a quite wide range of people going to the academies. Uh, we are very sure the main problems we have, and it is why it's why it's very, very it's it's not very well studied. There are very rare uh, archives of these institutions. Because, in fact, they were not public institutions. They were private institutions uh, run by a private director. And so very often uh, the archives are, you know, the family archives in France, uh, in Italy it's much better, but in France are not well preserved, uh, mainly because of the revolution, you know, things which were destroyed, and so a lot of things have been destroyed. And so we don't have a lot of uh, um, uh, registration, for example, of students. What we can see is that you know, very often, and, and it's much more difficult because uh, there were two categories. Those who were attending the academy as a boarding school, and those who were only using the teaching facilities, and so living in the city and going to some lectures or some, some exercises at the, at, at the academy. In this case, they were not registered at the academy, but they just paid the master. So that means we have to have the archives of the master. Uh, for example, uh, to be very precise, there is a very mm, uh, good archive in, in Padua for one acad ac uh, academy, which is called the, uh, the Academia Delia. Very large archive. And it's a, a well-known academy for uh, German students on their tour uh, in, to Italy since the beginning of the 17th century. But most of, I discovered, I was very surprised, most of these German stu stu uh, students were not living in the academy, but living in the flat in the city, were only paying the, 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 the riding master. And they, they don't uh, appear in the, uh, in the accounts of the academy. So it's, it's, it's a complex question. Uh, my impression, it's more an impression than, you know, uh, uh, precise uh, analysis. My impression is that a part of the uh, noble society of the city uh, went to the academy uh, to attend part of the exercises, what, what, what they needed, language, uh, uh, mainly uh, horse riding, things like that. Uh, those who uh, were uh, living in the academies, so, and so using it as a boarding school, were members of the high aristocracy, European aristocracy, because it was expensive. They were very often on a grand tour, and you know, a grand tour which lasts between two and five years is something very expensive, so very socially uh, uh, defined. So, and then you, you can follow them because they have. Uh, they occupied important charges in governments in England very often. This is very often the, the tour is interrupted because the young noble is a candidate at the House of Commons. He's, he's 20, 21, but he's a candidate at the House of Commons because there's kind of, you know, a family seat he has to uh, occupy. And so uh, lots of them go to uh, have a political career as, as a member of parliament in England, for example. So this, this gives you an, a very clear idea of the differences between the, the different group of the European nobilities. But I think, you know, there is an encounter between not a small nobility, but local nobility and, and very high international aristocracy. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, I wonder, uh, one of the most interesting things that you brought out was um, the sort of transnational, uh, international character of these, 
places. And I wonder uh, whether you have evidence of um, the survival of relationships formed during these two year periods or however long they were there afterward. I mean, are there networks of relationships that develop across Europe because of this or, or not? Do you have any evidence of that? I'm looking for evidence. <laughs> this is a question, you know, uh, I'm following since years. And uh, because at the beginning, I said, this is, you know, the place of networking, the very simple. So, uh, so and they, they are young and they, all, all they, they are creating their network for their life. You need so many kind, different kind of archives, letters, many letters, and so they are not very well preserved. So uh, maybe I've, you know, I've not looked in, uh, in the right archives. You know, there are many, many family archives in England, for example. I'm sure there are in interesting things. I don't know any study of, of, of the kind uh, made by you know uh, British uh, colleagues. So uh, for Italy, I tried, but uh, with very, very small results and very, you know, obvious things, you know, uh, because very often what we, the, 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 the simple fact, the, the, the simpler evidence is the fact that when they are staying in a place, they ask for recommendation letters. And so this is the beginning of contact. So, and so these recommendation letters are very often preserved, but it's just during, you know, one, two, three years and no more. And then, and then uh, very few things, very few things. But obvi uh, um, it's quite obvious it's, uh, it's a place where networks are, uh, were created. That's true. <laughs> so what is the extent, the interest is not the fact that there's a network, but the extent of these networks? And were they really transnational? Yes, Louise. <laughs> uh, but also I'm thinking uh, that the court that's hosting these academies mentioned that there were court activities in the evening. And that must be terrific for a court uh, in some of the smaller places in Italy, for example, to really keep up a court. Mm -hmm. So the benefit that, that redounds to the court itself, the noble, the noble that has organized the academy, is also considerable. But I think... So it's a net financial, I suppose. But in terms of prestige and actually being able to have a court, mm -hmm. you have these wonderful people coming and uh, participating. But I think this is one of the reasons of the success of some very specific academies which were reorganized or reorganized from the midst of the 17th century onwards. Because I have very clear testimonies about it in Terrain, like I, I told you, the king, you, you, if, you are a, if you have a certain status, of course, you may be received by the king, which is very, in France very difficult, for example. So in a small court, it's quite easy to access to the, to, to, to the sovereign. In, 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 even in, in, uh, in Nancy, for example, the Duchy of Lorraine, uh, the Duke is used to uh, um, have four or five students of the academy every evening at his own table. So for the students, it's obviously something very prestigious. And for the, you see, from the, so, for so the sovereign too, it's something very important. You also, it's a, you can show them you have a very international court and a very active, and it's uh, you know, and there are resources for the future too. <laughs> and if you're putting on an opera, for example, you have some people in the audience. <laughs> 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 so I have a weird we probably should wrap up pretty soon, but I I have a, a question. Carla. Um, so you mentioned how the in one of the early letters that you quoted, you mentioned the English father who wants to make sure that his son learns Italian while he's at the mm. in Italy. How did the other courts function? Did they also teach languages at the other courts? And um, if not, how, what was the lingua franca that was used at these courts? I suppose the lingua franca um, in the 18th century is French, I suppose. Not certain, it's French. But uh, there are some very precise elements in, uh, in general in, in the main British correspondence I've, I've read. And there is a very strong uh, effort, effort um, made to learn l different languages and to learn and to write languages. As I, 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 I've quoted uh, letters uh, of Lord Chesterfield, so it, they are very famous letters because they were pub used, you know, they were reorganized and published in 1770 as a, 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 a book of etiquette with the title Letters to My Son. 
And but at the same time, they are original letters, and so you can follow the the the, the principle, even if there is. Sometimes you can think that it's more normative than other correspondence. But in, in every, there is a, a real uh, linguistic apprenticeship of the young noble because he's first sent from England to a small academy in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And in this place, uh, it's, so this is a religious element, he goes to a Protestant country where the uh, language used in the country and in the teaching is French, Lausanne. It, 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 don't, it, it doesn't have a good French at this time. So then, and then Lausanne is on the border of a German-speaking area. Bern is just the frontier in Switzerland. So it, it begins with German. And then he goes to Leipzig, where he spent set seven months to learn German law, and he is not in the academy, but in in the house of a professor of German law, a very famous Markov, a very famous professor at the time, who is used to have, a, you know, a kind of boarding school <laughs> as several students at home and giving lessons, particular lessons to uh, noble students, and so. And then, and he, each time his father obliged him to send description of the country in the language of the country. So in French when he's in Switzerland, in German when he's in Germany, then in Italian when he has spent some time in Italy, and then in French when he comes back to France. So there is a real apprenticeship of the languages for another reason. A lot of these, of this very select group, and it's a select group of the aristocracy, want to be, uh, to embrace their diplomatic career. And so they have to know languages. Even if there is a lingua franca, it's always better in a way to <laughs> speak local language. Well, in, some, in some types of places in Europe, it, Italian was the lingua franca. But it's not. No, it's, that's true. Even you know, uh, uh, even in the 18th century, Italian is, is one of the main language language at, at the Austrian court. The, 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 the official poet at the Austrian court in the midst of the 18th century is Metastasio, which is a, who is an Italian poet. Okay, do we have one last question? Jean. <laughs> I have two small questions. The first one is, is there a relationship between uh, the ratio studio of the academies and the education of the royal priests? So is there the same evolution in the two uh, uh, or, or not? Or are they completely uh, distant? <laughs> My second question is about the use you need of uh, Castiglione on your part. Uh, for me, Castiglione is, uh, in a way, it's a very opposite to the academy. Because first, because he thinks that there's no training. And two, because of the uh, question, uh, really are absolutely necessary uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the discussion. And, uh, because they organize the discussion, that they need, you know, and, and uh, of course, academia. So, uh, uh, yes, now we'll begin with your second question, because uh, I think it's very important. You know, Castiglione's book, <laughs> it, this kind of amazing book, which is a dialogue. That means you can express opposite position in the dialogue. So then you have always the difficulty to, to, to define, but what is the author's real position? And every argument every, uh, uh, which is expressed is, an, is a real argument. So in Castiglione, you have those who say the famous sprezzatura, the fact that you have to be natural, and you can't learn how to be natural because you have to be natural. Well, it's kind of a classical paradox in a way. <laughs> but the, 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 the response which comes at the end is the fact that you can't teach, but you may imitate. And so I think you can, there's, there's a little difference, but it's, which is not, uh, uh, which is important. So this is why I think that, um, an academy is different from a Jesuit college because there is no program. There is no ratio studio room in the, in the academy. It's free. Uh, a teacher can or may or can organize uh, his lectures uh, as he wants. He can organize his lecture according to the level, the competencies of his students. So it's something very different from a, a formal teaching. Castillon wrote before the Jesuits, and he didn't know the existence of the Radio Studio Room. <laughs> but uh, I think this is the, the this is the difference. Anyway, uh, I, I think 
uh, uh, what is expressed in, in Castiglione is really the heart of what were, you know, the main values and the main behavior, behaviors of the high aristocracy. And this is a set of behaviors, things, values that we were more or less shared at European level, I think. I think I, I said more or less, obviously, because it's not something mechanical. But, uh, and I think it's a, it, it's it's something very very central. Not the book itself, but all the literature which were which was um, produced, imitating uh, Castiglione, copying Castiglione, tra transforming Castiglione. You know, Peter Burke has found a fantastic book in in Polish which is not a translation, but a an, an, uh, recontextualization of the courtier at the, uh, in, in uh, uh, um, the, um, Krakow, in, in, at the court of Krakow. Uh, so. Okay, that will have to close. <laughs>